Throughout the country, people are planting seeds of innovation, harvesting a bounty of ideas to help care for the only home we have, planet Earth. With billions of people on Earth, it is more important than ever to open our eyes and minds to alternative ideas, both new and old, about food, energy, resources, health, housing, and more. The core of sustainability is meeting the needs of today's society without compromising the world for future generations. In this series, our field reporters will explore eco-friendly ideas and lifestyles that help to make our world a little bit better. Welcome to My World 2, short stories of sustainable living and earthly innovations. This is a story of how one person's junk literally becomes another person's dream home. We join field producer Tom Gray and learn how a home was built from free materials listed on the internet and found items that would have ended up in a landfill. Hey guys, Doug, Cindy. Hey Tom, how are you doing? Good Welcome to see to you. Hi, Farms. Thank welcome you. to Longevity Farms. I've heard a lot about this place. Now, is it, is it true that a lot of this farm and your outbuildings is all built from Craigslist throwaway materials? Uh, pretty much. I'd say 90% of it was found on Craigslist. And there's also stuff that I've gotten for some of the jobs. I do construction. I have leftover stuff from my jobs that I incorporate as well. Fifteen years ago when we started, we actually you know, bought a house plan thinking, oh, we're going to build this traditional home. Um, and then as the years started kind of going by, we're thinking, well, maybe we should try to do something a little less expensive and um, then we started getting more into repurposing we're thinking well maybe we could use you know different wood or windows just to maybe save on costs and then we realized there were so many things that were being discarded and not used just amazing pieces um, of windows and wood that just would have disappeared from earth so we brought them down here and just accumulated them in a couple of shipping containers. Our home turned into just a home that was pretty much repurposed, furniture and all. I designed it and drew it and came up with it, but it kind of evolved as the project went along. When you're buying from Craigslist, you can't always, you know, stick to a blueprint. We spent about 10 years before we started any construction of just stockpiling items here in the field. A lot of the stuff was taken off buildings that were, you know, being demolitioned and, you know, somebody had a thought that, hey, maybe I could put this on Craigslist instead of burning it or throwing it in the dump. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I came in. You know, being a carpenter, I love old growth, old wood, old everything, and they don't have a lot of the, the old growth these days. Everything's a quick grow product. So I wanted the old growth wood that only comes from repurposing. And I wanted the barn to look old the day it was finished. I didn't want it to look like a brand new shiny building. Yeah, it definitely has that rustic feel. Mm -hmm. You can't build it overnight, like you say, with new materials. Right. And Cindy, I know you're a big part of this whole operation and, and beautiful farm. What's your passion here? Being outdoors and taking care of the garden and all the landscaping and the flowers. We are growing currently for just a couple of restaurants in town, um, doing some heirloom tomatoes and um, we've got some watermelon and grapes and asparagus. The, yeah, we did asparagus in the spring. Doug, the portable sawmill, uh, something that you don't, not every home has, especially a farm, but you've got the skills and the talent to utilize such a product? Well, you, uh, you eventually acquire skills and talent when you get something like this. So it's been an integral part of doing the whole project. So I, I harvest the trees here. Uh, the mill enables me to cut it to any type of material I want, whether it's three quarter or live edge or, uh, you know, furniture, lumber, whatever. And the lumber uh, I see right here, it's all come from your own 20 acres? Uh, we have a lot of timber here that we like to harvest, and a lot of it's dead standing. We're very environmentally conscious, so uh, we don't want to lose our woods. We love our woods. And when you have a tree that's dying or dead and it's standing there, it's basically just going to be wasted. Mm -hmm. So I'm repurposing as well in the, in the forest as much as I can. Doug, there's a lot of trees right here, and I know that the house is probably already full and beautifully built. What's going to happen with all this one right here? Well, this lumber here is, is future projects. Uh, we don't really have anything specified for it because I kind of do things on the fly. But I have uh, a lot of projects that I'm working on right now. I'm working on a tree house in the woods. Doug, you're not lying. This is a uh, pretty big project, a tree house that everyone's going to love this one, huh? 
Yeah, it's uh, 12 by 18, and uh, we put it up 12 feet in the air, so it's not actually built into a tree, but it's built in with the trees. Mm -hmm. And I see some, is this telephone poles? Yeah, these are repurposed telephone poles that I got off of uh, the local power company that was pleased to see them go away. Yeah. And you got some really rustic looking, what are they, 4 by 12s or something up there? Yeah, uh, those are repurposed 4 by 12s. They were a stairs on an apartment complex that I took all the stairs out and uh, the 4 by 12s, I, I wound up with about 40 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, these are rafters that we have made out of uh, repurposed plywood that mm -hmm. came from a warehouse that used plywood for their pallets. Uh, it's one inch thick. We laminated it and glued it and made a barrel. We're making a barrel roof on the treehouse. The stairs were repurposed out of a remodel job we did. We took them out of a home and uh, they sat here for about 10 years. And I said, well, that'll fit with the tree house that fits with everything else. So we, we repurposed them here. Well, I'm still waiting to see this house, Doug. Anticipation is killing me, so we've got to see what's inside. I'll be glad to show you. I can see what you mean. Look at the wood in this house right here. It's all reclaimed, huh? It's all reclaimed. Um, the beams here were found after the fact, after the house was drawn, but they fit so perfectly that I just brought them, incorporated them into the build. Uh, found them in northern Missouri. They were actually the beams that went over a gymnasium for a high school. And they're one continuous length? Yeah, one continuous length. They're called a glue lamb beam. You know, we had to get the telephone poles set first and get them cut to length to set these beams on top. And the telephone poles are also another uh, reclaimed uh, from the Power and Light Company. Right. But the uh, flooring on top of that came from an old building in downtown that was uh, being demolished. Uh, it was 100 years old, and they were. It was a warehouse, so it fit right in with the flooring I wanted to put in here. So that's part of the fun of it. You know, is taking something and making something new out of something old and making something really cool out of something that maybe wasn't in its original purpose, you know, like the, the flooring from the factory, you know, it probably wasn't that cool there, but it's a lot cooler here. Yeah. What are some of those unique things that you put in the house here? Well, there's several things. Uh, the, I've got a spiral staircase that takes you up to the living space, and I've got a hand dryer that came out of an old gas station from the 1940s, oldest gas station in town. Uh, they were remodeling it, so it was headed for the demolition pile. And uh, those are dumpster finds that, you know, kind of make a house unique and, you know, special. Mm -hmm. And what's above us, Doug? What's on the next level up? Well, the next level is our living area, and I've got a few things that I've done up there as well, and I'd be glad to show it to you. This I wasn't expecting. Doug, this room is, it's gorgeous. You've, you've got the colors, the wood, the rock. I bet you Cindy had a lot to do with the designers of this room. She did, she, uh, she's the one who figures out where to put everything to make it you know, feel like a home. I'm good at making that thing, mm -hmm. but she's good at putting it where it needs to go. As we were building, um, we were um, sleeping in a tent on the weekends outside and then um, when the building was at least enclosed so we could get inside we were sleeping on the floor um, which isn't very comfortable I said so the next time we come out honey I'd like to have a um, bed to sleep on so he got logs out of the woods <laughs> cut them made a platform put the logs down and we blew up an air mattress and that was the bed and as of today that is now our bed that he added a few things to to make it a little more bedroom friendly so as a home that's not new you've got that rustic feel it looks like a homestead it feels like a homestead I noticed the windows I love windows where did those windows come from well the windows were also a Craigslist find um, I had windows initially slated for this build these kind of fell into my lap and it completely changed everything about the house um, they're they're much better windows much bigger much open and that's what we were looking for and the floorboards I love floorboards like that very rustic very natural it looks so nice. Well, this is the side that was uh, the factory workers worked on, and so it has a lot of the patina that came with that wood that was used in a factory. So I, I, I kind of left that. We didn't sand it. We didn't do anything to it. We put a, uh, a slight coat on it, and it makes a real warm, beautiful yeah. floor. And the, the modern kitchen, you've got some modern features in there that everyone needs to have for, for cooking, and it's a really nice combination of both, the, the old, the new, and, of course, the efficiency is going to have to be the thing you're really looking for, right? Yeah, efficiency was a, was a big factor. 
uh, you know, like the stove. That's something I bought new because I want the scraps that come from the mill, I want it to be as efficient as possible to heat the house as much as it can. And the older stoves were great, they're pretty, but they just don't match the efficiency of that one. Building a house from scratch uh, and paying for a carpenter, etc., usually is about the four to five hundred, from what I can tell, a house like this. Can I ask the question, what did it cost you to build this house based on your materials? Well, it's, it's a tough question to ask because it was done over a long period of time and there's a lot of accumulation that wasn't, you know, really kept track of. But I've, I've thought about it and I'd say it's around $70,000 in materials. Right. So that's what you paid for from Craigslist people, from vendors that you paid for. Naturally, you're a craftsman and you've got those skills to, to assemble and put this house together. So it's a huge saving right there, right? Oh yeah, very much so. If I had to build this house, I would expect to be around that $400,000 range. A great, a great trade to have behind you, okay? It is a great trade. Uh, it's a trade I love and uh, I've done it my whole life and I'm very happy with it. Doug, it's been really impressive. Um, you're a true inspiration of what you and Cindy have built over these last 10 years and given these materials a complete second life. You know, so thanks for the tour. Um, I loved it, absolutely loved it. Well, thanks for coming and uh, I enjoyed giving you the tour and I enjoy sharing it with others. Well, you're a good friend, thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Loss to disease, storms, or construction are saved from the landfill and turned into lumber for furniture and custom woodworking. Let's join Kyle Stanley on a walking tour of urban lumber. Hi, Tim. Good to meet you. Thanks for coming down. Yeah, thanks for having us. I'm glad to show you around our showroom. This is the Urban Lumber Company showroom, and in, inside the showroom we have all sorts of different kinds of local species of wood that we have taken from the waste stream. So this is all logs or, or tree parts that came from that weren't cut down for like a commercial lumber mill, but were cut down for whatever reason, development or insect or whatever, and they're in the waste stream, so they're gonna be ground up and turned into mulch, and we take them out of the waste stream, saw them up, and make beautiful lumber out of it. So if I wanted to make a table, I could come and pick out my own piece of wood, the same yeah, member of the public? Absolutely, and, and, and it's everything in between. So people will come and take rough lumber home and just do it themselves if they're inclined. Some people have no interest in woodworking, but just want something from the city's urban core in their home, in their space, a nice piece of wood with a good live edge or something sure. like that. And it's kind of fun for a couple of reasons. Number one, we get beautiful lumber, but number two, because these weren't commercially grown, they're wild and people love the wild grain. Oh, yeah, so sure. you can see, you know, this is, a, this is hackberry, it grows all over the city and we get incredible spalting and variegation in it and people come in and think it's a zebra wood from somewhere else in a different right. continent and it's all like in our backyard. So all these massive logs that we just saw up the road, those are, they end up here? Waiting to be sawed, yeah. Yeah, we've got a bunch out back, we've got a queue, we've got a dry pile and a sawmill on site, and so we'll saw it, dry it, and then when it's ready, it's all database, we've got photographs of everything, we know where it came from. On the labels, it says where it came from in the city. For example, this board came from Kansas City Parks and Rec. It's all a part of a big log. You can see they all came from, this is the log number, and it probably came down from a storm when the parks dealt with, you know, 20 or 30 trees that are down. We'll get a call, they'll bring them to us, and we'll saw them up and make great lumber for it. So Tim, how many different varieties of wood do you guys have here? Oh wow, that's hard to say. Uh, pretty much anything that grows around the city, maybe up to 17 different species. Yeah, this is beautiful. What's, Thanks. What yeah, is this? this is a this is this one's ready to go. I got to put one more coat of finish on it, sand it down tonight, and put one more on it. This is a black walnut table for a great couple that came in two weeks ago. It's really cool. This stuff's not actually coming from forests. Yeah, it's, it's a mind-blowing uh, to think about all of uh, the city trees going to waste. In fact, there's a statistic that uh, of our nation's commercial timberland, there's an amount equal to 25% in the cities that just goes to waste. And so the urban wood movement, which is kind of a thing, uh, takes advantage of all that wood that was previously not used and makes beautiful products and people love it because they know where it came from. So Tim, what are the various markings on all these? Well, that lets us know where they came from. Uh, the, way, the way that we work is people will bring logs in from different parts of the town. So, for example, the AI came from the Kansas City Art Institute. They're building a new dorm and they took down a bunch of trees. So we got those logs. Uh, the KC logs came from Kansas City Parks and Rec. Those are ash. They came down from Pest, the emerald ash borer. And then there's also some white oak that came down for a, from a park renovation. After they're sawn, you know, the good stuff will go in the dry pile. Everything that's left over from the sawing process will go in our scrap pile. And the great thing about that is that Kevin will come down and scoop it all up and turn it into mulch, so nothing gets wasted. 
Man, Tim, thanks for having us out here. This is too cool. Uh, thanks for coming out. You know, I love talking about it. I love showing people around and I love uh, spreading the word. It's a, a great resource that I hate seeing go to waste. And so it's, it's fantastic when people can take advantage of it. And I love helping along the way. Across the Western Colorado Plateau, fields are alive with the fragrance of lavender, a popular herb used throughout history for health, perfume, cooking, and more. Well, lavender dates back to biblical times, to Roman times. It's used in their baths to wash. It even dates back to Egyptian times, actually. So the benefits of lavenders are huge, and that's what makes a plant so amazing and almost an addictive in a, in a certain way as a, as a grower because it has multiple uses and you never stop learning about the plant. My name is Paola Lagar and we're at Sage Creations Organic Farm in Palisade, Colorado. We're a diverse certified organic farm. We farm 10 acres and we grow six acres of lavender and aromatic herbs as well as culinary herbs. We also have sweet cherries and a market garden with vegetables. And my mom has been running this farm for about 15 years now, and so I've grown up here. Well, mostly my job at the farm is working with all the retail stuff, so I really deal with customers, helping them find plants, products. We're in Palisade, Colorado, which is the western slope, and we're in the high desert. Um, our farm sits at 4,800 feet. So it's a very arid climate, very dry. We have about an average of nine inches of rainfall a year. So all our irrigation water comes from the Colorado River, and it makes it just a great climate for, uh, for growing lavender. It likes to be stressed at times, and which then it produces really great essential oil. We use all drip irrigation. Um, we, water is a valuable resource here. Um, we basically have water from April through October. And what's great about a lot of the herbs that we grow is that they don't take a lot of water. I came from an organic farming background, so it seemed like an obvious fit, something that I've always believed in. And those are the methods that I learned as a, a young grower and as apprentice, I learned um, about organic farming. I think it's very important to uh, have an organic farm and have organic supplies and suppliers. Um, and it means a lot to me because I have grown up in that sort of environment. And I think really keeping an eye on what you're eating and where you're getting your plants and your food and even the products that you're using, looking at ingredients and how they're made. I think that's very important to have an actual future for the next generations. We do utilize uh, certain bugs on the farm that I actually bring in and we will do releases in our greenhouses and our orchard systems. A great beneficial insects are lacewings and uh, ladybugs or lady beetles. The good bugs control the bad bugs, um, which then you won't have to spray. So I always like to go through to those methods before I revert to spraying. Well, bees are incredibly important, and bumblebees and other pollinating insects. Um, they will they pollinate our cherry trees, for example. Um, that's what will produce a, a better and bigger crop. Uh, they also pollinate our tomato plants um, and our eggplant. So pollinators are very important to create an abundant crop. So there are some weeds that I actually welcome when they come up in the spring, and one of them is dandelions is a great example because the bees are very hungry in that early spring, and that's the first thing to bloom. And that way they have some flowers to forage. So lavender is a very, I think, more of a complex plant than a lot of people think it is. Um, so there's a lot of different species and varieties. Um, and so it's, it has a lot of really amazing uses. So usually people think of lavender as something to relax with or to eat and sleep, but there's also lavender to help invigorate and wake up. The two species that we grow, the Angustifolias, which are the true lavenders, is the most cold hardy, and that's one of the reasons we also grow it here. The uses are endless, and as a landscape plant, it's beautiful. And it, it's a great plant to have in your garden because it does promote bee health and it's a great xeriscape plant. It doesn't take a lot of water. It's also a great plant to cook with. It's an herb. It, it goes well with all kinds of other savory herbs like rosemary and sage and thyme. The other species that we grow are the X intermedias, or what's commonly known as lavendin. 
and that has its chemical compounds are going to be higher in camphor and terpene. Um, it's also a plant that's great for anti has anti-inflammatory properties, great for skin care, um, great for cleaning. I, I clean my entire house with the distillate um, that comes and the essential oils that comes from the lavender plant. It's been used from painters for many years, going back to the 17th and 18th century. Painters will use it to mix into their oil paints. Um, so it's artists have been using it for, for centuries. So here at Sage Creations, we process everything about the plant. We actually will propagate the plant to make a new plant for to grow our fields and we'll also grow for growers and um, we'll sell the plants retail to gardeners. So we start that plant in the fall um, from a, a small little cutting and grow that in the greenhouse on a heated, we have heated beds in the greenhouse. But with the, the established plants, we actually harvest. Our harvest begins in June and goes through the first part of uh, August and then and also sometimes in the fall on, with plants that will actually double bloom. So we will harvest the plants for culinary use or for the essential oils and the hydrosols. And what we do with the essential oils and the hydrosols, we'll, we'll sell that bottled and retail or bulk to processors and we'll also incorporate it in our own bath and body product line. And as far as the culinary lavender, we will sell that too as well to processors. People make lavender wine, lavender beer, ice cream, all kinds of things that you can incorporate lavender to. Essential oil from a plant is the oil that comes straight from the plant. So it's 100% pure oil that that plant produces. So if you're looking for 100% pure essential oil, it's going to take a lot of plant material to produce that. So for, you know, when you go to the store and you find you have a small bottle of a lavender essential oil or perhaps some other essential oil, the reason it may be so costly is because it took a lot of plant material to produce that small amount of oil. So the hydrosol is the distillate that comes straight out of the condenser and it's the the essential oil is what we siphon off of, of the hydrosol. So what's left is, is that floral water. So for example, specifically to lavender, um, how we process it, we're actually just starting now to uh, process our new crop. So we start with, uh, when we're harvesting for ornamental bundles or culinary lavender, we will we'll bundle actually in the field, we'll harvest and bundle, and then we'll take it to our drying rooms and hang it to dry. Um, and then that, it, from that stage, we'll actually, if it's an ornamental bundle, um, we will sell it as a bundle. But if we sell it as a culinary uh, flower bud, then we'll actually take those buds off and um, clean it through a seed cleaner. And if it's for essential oils, we don't bundle. We just harvest all that lavender loose and put it in the still pot and distill it fresh right from the field. It's very important to buy from small farms and really family-owned operations. Um, especially in agriculture, you can see you know, the big stuff in the grocery stores, but trying to find the farm stands and the local families that are growing around you, it's really important to support those families because they're the ones that are really you know, putting your food on the table and making things happen and putting jobs out there for a lot of people who would have trouble finding jobs otherwise. And um, it's very important to support what's around you and small families because they're really the small cogs that are keeping the earth going. <laughs> I would say as an herbal farmer, I definitely encourage people to support their local herb farms and um, learn about them and see how to incorporate the, it in your life to basically better your life in many ways, whether it be through aromatherapy or whether it be through skin care or culinary, incorporate it into your daily practice of life and you'll fall in love with it for sure.
Nick, can you talk to me about the, the philosophy behind the maker community of, of everything has a purpose, everything has a use? Makers are creative. Makers look at, you know, discarded objects and, and see the value in what they can make with it. Well, Whitney, thank you so much for inviting us into your studio. Yeah. Uh, I think the reason we're here is to talk about this, your dress. Yeah, so it's just a panel design that I came up with and I created it from about four pairs of thrifted jeans. Oh wow, so these were jeans that someone else had already gotten all their use out of and now you're turning it into something, something else, something exactly. new? Exactly. If I'm understanding you correctly, you are retrofitting parts and lights for these microscopes so that they, this doesn't end up in a landfill. That's it right. continues to be used. That's right. Heirloom seeds is kind of a loose term, and it means different things to different people, but it's basically a traditional variety. Some places call them heritage varieties or antique varieties. It's basically a variety that's been passed down from family to family, just like heirloom furniture or jewelry or whatever you might have been in your family. They're traditional family varieties is what it means. As far as how old they are, it varies, you know, depending on the definition, but generally considered 50 or 100 years old or, you know, older. 